I'm delighted to welcome you all to our second POCUS webinar. Today is the 5th of May and the time is 6 p.m. I'm Dr. Priyadarshini Marathe and I'm the POCUS lead at Oxford University Hospital's Emergency Department. Today we've got a presentation by Dr. Judson Paul on how to clean and disinfect your POCUS machines during the COVID-19 pandemic, followed by five cases on lung ultrasound. We'll then move on to discussing how to document cases that we've done on the EPR. After that, we're going to have a discussion on the certification and sign-off process for lung ultrasound, both in emergency medicine and acute medicine. So we've got a great lineup this time. And um, let's begin. The first presentation is Dr. Judson Paul. So, are you all able to see my slides? Is my screen visible? Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay, thank you. So, the first important thing which has been done, which will prevent cross-contamination is that there is a allocated red machine or the respiratory ED has a separate machine. Uh, it's parked just next to the recess two. So, this machine does not go into the non-respiratory zone. So it's exclusively for the respiratory ED. And this is one important uh, step to preventing cross-contamination. The second important thing is to prepare before we enter a patient encounter. So the key is to prepare all equipment and everything that we need before we enter. And for prepare, basically we are like, we have all our equipment we need. We are we have our armor before we enter a patient encounter. So I've uh, put prepare under three P's. One is probe, preset, and personal or person. So the probe, you first choose the correct probe, and you place a probe cover. There are probe covers placed below the machine, so. Uh, they have to be placed on the probe. I think it's the curvilinear probe that we most likely will be using. So choose the probe, place jelly on the probe, place a probe cover. And the second thing is the preset or the machine settings. Choose your settings before you enter the patient encounter. So you select the appropriate probe on the machine. Um, choose lung preset. Enter your patient and operator details, the MRN, the name and the numbers, and choose the approximate depth and gain and other settings which might be needed. So the machine and the preset must be set before entering. The third thing is like always wear your personal protective equipment, but we thought we should add double gloves on top of whatever you're wearing. I will get to why we will we, we are uh, asking you to double glove to prevent um, cross contamination in the subsequent slides. So after you finished your patient encounter, you dock. So first you get the probe cover off and then you get your personal protective equipment off, you dock them. So along with doffing your personal protective equipment, you get the outer pair of gloves out. So you still have your, you still have a pair of gloves on with which you can just clean the machine. So that's why we are asking to have two pairs of gloves. And with your existing pair of gloves, you clean the machine with the green cleaner wipes totally. Just the screen, the wires, the cables, the probe, everything has to be cleaned completely wiped down uh, so another useful trick is to place a clinal on the probe as you are doffing so the the clinal wipe is just soaking the probe as you are doffing and after you have doffed you can clean the probe and the clinal has been on the probe all the while you are doffing and then it helps clean it down better and the final thing is to replace and charge the machine. So this is also an important step because if you leave the machine in the hallway 
or in a place where it's not supposed to be there can uh, other people can touch it there can be contamination by patients moving around and uh, so we would like to replace the machine in its place and also charge it so that uh, next time the operator needs to use it they don't have to fiddle around with the power cables and pull things around and contaminate the power cables and they're good to go and the, and the machine is charged so replace and charge is also an important step so we have on the machine a cleaning protocol of just the steps which i've just mentioned it's on the machine it just looks like a simple poster like this so i think these few steps can help prevent um in like can keep the machine disinfected and help us clean and prevent cross contamination thank you thanks judson that's really helpful that's really helpful thank you can i um can i um start by um asking you to sort of um tell us where the probe covers are, are they with the machine or 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 and for those of us that have butterfly iqs where can we get probe covers so we have a stock of the probe covers a few numbers just below the machine i've just placed a few on the machine just near the bottom portion near the wheels so we will try to replace them as and when they get exhausted but otherwise in the store machine there are a bunch of probe covers just as you enter the store on the left hand side there's a box with probe covers and one of the storing the store assistants or the stocking managers will be able to help you out if in case you run out of them okay i got one more question as we're going to the floor um sure. we're going to start we're going to start using pocus in hospital at home so going out scanning patients their own home on care homes particularly um how do you think we can adapt this protocol for those of us who want to start using this for acute assessment in out of hospital settings um most of the steps i think will be the same but i don't know what kind of machine you will be using it probably will be uh in an iq uh, in iq okay it's probably a handheld device and so we probably will get we'll need to get some cover which will end enclose both the probe and the like device like say a phone or the ipad to which it's connected that will be the only step i think which will be different uh, so the whole thing is enclosed into one single cover but otherwise i think uh, preparing and cleaning uh, would be almost the same brilliant okay so any questions for Judson on how to keep your probe clean. So there's a, uh, there was some discussion about Horton machines. Uh, we have only the Sonocyte Edge 2 at the Horton, uh, which is kept in the main ED. And for the moment, all resources, uh, resource cases are being managed in the main ED, not on the respiratory side. Um, so if you need that machine to take care of resus patients in the main ED, then you please use the Sonocyte Edge 2. Uh, there's a question about, uh, their, their, uh, we haven't seen any probe covers at the Horton. Um, we'll work on that and uh, Judson and I will make sure there's some probe covers uh, on the machine at the Horton uh, as soon as possible. We uh, Michael says that there's a mind drain EAU, which in Horton EAU, which he's done some scans with on the wards, and it's been left in the respiratory ED. But well, that's great. Uh, when I'm there next, or when Judson is there next, we'll um, put up the same poster that you're seeing on your screen just now on the on the machine and keep the probe covers there too. Sure, it'd be great. Uh, Dan, uh, how are you taking care of your butterfly IQ? Um, not as rigorously as I should. Um, so, um, in in this in City Hospital in Birmingham, uh, we tend to so we tend not to use covers, um, but to have quite a quite a substantial um, 
uh, sort of protocol for, for using lots of wipes afterwards, two different uh, types of disinfectant wipes, um, which is fine if you're in a hospital that's surrounded by those things, but when you're out on the road, I think covers and Clinel are probably going to be the best way to, to, to do that. So I'm going to have to adapt this and probably come up with a protocol that I'll share with you for your comments so that those of the start doing this in out-of-hospital environments as part of the um, OUH acute um, acute um, outreach team uh, have a have a protocol that we can stick to and then you know give people confidence that we're not we're not making anything worse by by scanning or any adding benefit. Okay, uh, are there any other devices other people are using on the group today? and you want to tell us what you're doing with your machines? Okay, yeah, I, think. I think we're then Okay, well look, Justin, that was really helpful. Um, we've, we've, we've recorded, uh, we're recording tonight's session, so you're, you're live on Channel 4, do not swear. Um, and we will uh, make this available down for people to um, to review afterwards um but I, this poster will be up in ed is that right was up already judson it's up on the machines already yes great so it might be nice if we can have a have a version of that for aau maybe regina uh, yeah that would be very helpful actually and then we can stick it up and so we've got a reminder for when we're using it on aau we've got we're seeing rest patients um, on AAU. Yeah, i think um, lucy just came and spoke so Okay. okay, yeah, so just to know about the FEM critical care paramedics, the HEMS guys, so what, the, what they're doing, because they've obviously got a V scan, haven't they? So, um, so that would be great for that. Okay. Uh, before we go ahead, can I just ask everyone to mute their own devices, please? Um, uh, and you can switch it on when you when you're want to speak, that's fine. Okay, so maybe it's time to move on to cases now. Uh, and can we start with Karim? You've got some interesting stuff for us. Karim, do you want to uh, screen share and, and present your case to the group? Sure, thank you. <coughs> Let's see, screen share. All right, can you see that? That's working well. Hi everyone, I've just got one case to share. So my name's Karim, I'm one of the AAU registrars. Um, <coughs> so in AAU we're seeing a lot of patients coming in, um, some of them still with active COVID symptoms, but some, a lot of them now coming in four, five, and six weeks down the line. Um, and uh, we're quickly turning them around. A lot of them have quite negative looking, ex uh, normal looking x-rays. Uh, by definition, they're usually more clinically stable. They're coming to AAU. So this is just an example of a patient who was ambulated and went home so a few weeks ago. Um, so he uh, was a 66 year old gentleman. He presented with a five day history of a dry cough and quite intense lethargy. And over the preceding two days, he had quite significant breathlessness. Uh, in terms of his background, he'd been self-isolating with his wife. Uh, his wife had a mild flu-like illness two weeks ago, which had self-resolved. Um, and then he started developing the symptoms whilst isolating with her. In terms of his background, he was hypertensive, uh, had gout and just mild asthma, never been hospitalized. Um, medical <coughs> uh, medicines that he's on, he was on endapamide, doxazacin, ranipril, and serotide, and he was a non-smoker. Um, so when, we <coughs> when I saw him, he had a, a mild pyrexia, 37.6, otherwise the rest of his obs were fine, his sats were 97, he didn't desaturate on exertion, but he was very breathless and he was coughing. Um, otherwise, chest was clear, heart sounds were normal, uh, his ECG was fine. His blood showed uh, raised CRP uh, and the raised urea and his uh, renal, he had, a, he had a baseline of creatinine of 115, 116. And his lactate was elevated at 2.9. Um, so this is his x-ray. I'll give you a moment to look through it. And this x-ray was reported. Um, it was reported as if there was evidence of some bilateral um, atelect cysts which was chronic and seen on previous x-rays, uh, but otherwise clear, nothing acute. There's a small shadow here, which is reported as a nipple shadow. So pretty blameless chest x-ray, nothing acute on it. So 
proceeded to do point to Keo Xander Lung. And so it started with the right side. Uh, so this is R1, so anteriorly, superiorly on the chest, place the probe, and here we see your typical normal view. So we've got the bat swing sign, we've got ribs, ribs, rib shadow here, rib shadow here, subcutaneous tissue, intercostal muscle, and this bright white line here, that's the pleura. And then you can see as the patient breathes in and out, the pleura slides, and that's consistent with just normal appearances and rules out a pneumothorax. And just right below it, we see an A line, which is a normal reverberation artifact. And that's an example of normal lung. So that was his R1. Uh, and then just inferiorly to that, the second zone, R2, again, we see much the same normal rib, rib shadows. Um, the pleura here is sliding, and we can see a few more A lines here, all consistent with normal lung. And on the right, this is the posterolateral lateral aspect. Um, here, just to orientate you, the, the head of the patient is on this side, to the left, and the tail on the left, on the right side. And so what we see here is the, the, the liver. And as the patient takes a deep breath in, we see normal lung coming in for the lung curtain. Um, and that's because as, as the lung is nicely aerated, it just obstructs uh, the view of the liver as it comes in, as it's nice and normal. So completely normal on the right side. And then we move on to the left. So this is the left anterior superior. And immediately you can see that there's something different compared to the first view. So just to orientate you, that's a rib, that's rib shadow, that's a rib, that's rib shadow. Patient's head is to the left and patient's head to the right. You can see the pleura here already looks thicker than it did on the right side. And as the patient breathes in, you see the A lines being obliterated by B lines arising from the pleura. And, there's, and you can see that the B lines are become more confluent as, as the patient breathes in. And you can see that the pleura starts to become thicker and irregular. Moving down a few rib spaces, uh, you can see it more clearly here. Patient's coughing quite a bit. Luckily, I wore a visor for this patient. Um, and you can see the A lines here. And then as the patient breathes in or coughs, you can see these confluent B lines coming in with thicker pleura and an interruption in the pleura. So um, very typical of this, of COVID. Just to show you another image of that. Here it is, you see that discontinuation, irregular pleura, very confluent B lines in a skip lesion type pattern, um, which will, again is, is typically what we see uh, in COVID. And then looking at the posterolateral lateral aspects on the left side, so similar to before, head is on the top of the patient is on to the left, you can see the spleen here with the diaphragm just thickening as he takes a deep breath in and out and a normal looking lung curtain appearing posterolaterally. Um, so in, in summary, we had uh, a typical history, typical presentation of COVID suspected from the beginning, but with a completely normal x-ray. And yet on the ultrasound, we had very convincing uh, appearances of COVID, left-sided B lines and a skip lesion pattern with areas of confluent B lines appearing with thick, thick pleura and irregular pleura starting to develop that subpleural consolidation that we see. Uh, scanned his heart as well, and that was normal. Uh, he has fluid, he wasn't uh, particularly dry or, or looked like he was, had been over resuscitated. And we safety netted him, discharged at home, swabbed him. And the next day uh, his, his, uh, he, was, he came back as positive. Um, Followed up with a phone call. He was doing a bit better the next day. And then six weeks down the line, I called him again. He'd had a rather rocky clinical course, but luckily didn't need to have a repeat admission and he improved. So there you have it. That's one of the classic uh, stories that we're seeing of patients coming in. Normal x-ray, do not need to be admitted, uh, but very specific diagnostic features that you can find on ultrasound. Anyone got any questions? Have a look. How do I view the question? So, <clears throat> while, while waiting for the people to go in the chat, I think this is a really nice case, Karen. Thanks for presenting it. Um, as you say, it's so it's interesting you should focus in this post op phase. There's a lot of chat on Twitter, and the cases we talked about last week were all about you know initial diagnostics in COVID uh, and that first presentation. Here we're seeing a role in the follow up phase to try and work out well, you know, why is someone still breathless? Um, 
And, and I just wonder if you, and it's interesting to see the sort of almost the unilateral changes because often the ones I've seen have been bilateral. Do you have any comment on that and, and how the importance, I suppose, of the standardized assessment, otherwise we'll miss something? So I think um, the speaking just from limited experience, I think earlier on in the course, it tends to be asymmetrical and then spreads on to becoming bilateral. Um, that's one thing I've, I've sometimes noticed. Um, it's really important to compare both sides and also see how the distribution of the B lines are spread. If you see more symmetrical, equally spaced out bilateral B lines, you start thinking about your other differentials of fluid overload. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I'm seeing is in early well COVID patients with these changes is that the the postural lateral aspects tend to be spared earlier on and, and then when they become more sick that they become affected and certainly in icu you get the two different patterns the, the patterns that are affected are predominantly uh, affecting the bases that respond well to proning and those that are predominantly are affected anteriorly and respond better to high peep uh, or at least that's what what's been coming out uh, in people's experience uh, but yeah it's it's really important to compare like for like and, and do the structured assessment and to, to scan um, all the lungs just to get a feel of what the pattern of B lines are like. B lines are like. And a nice example uh, of, of the difference of, of, of how the insensitive the chest x-ray is to this to, to the underlying lung disease. I think as with uh, I think when we, we us poke lung, lung ultrasound enthusiasts know that changes always appear a lot earlier yeah. on x-ray on ultrasound compared to x-ray so this isn't a, a surprise for us um, and I think uh, it's particularly useful in those with normal observations that uh, you almost know that their x-ray is going to be normal because they're, they're so well uh, from a hemodynamic point of view um, and yet you can you can establish a diagnosis quite quickly using ultrasound. Yeah that's great. Uh, are there any questions for Karen on this case or anything people have picked up or observations people have or What's in the patients people may have seen like this? Thank you. There's a lot of food for thought, Karen. That's excellent. Okay. Thank you very much. Pleasure. So, is Yasir with us? Hello. Hi. Hi there. Hi. Thanks for joining. Uh, you, 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 got, you got a case for us? Yes. Um, yeah. Let me share you the screen. Get out the share screen on the share screen button and um, tell us all about it. Great, yeah, it's come up, that's great. Oh, is it clear? I think it's clear, it's clear what the answer should be to your question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, well, basically, um, this is, um, sorry. Well, my name is Yas, one of the uh, EM clinical fellows at JR here. And I'll be presenting uh, a very nice uh, case that I had where ultrasound actually changed management. And that's why I titled the presentation, Should the Probe Replace the Steth Stethoscope in 21st Century Emergency Medicine? Um, I'll start with a quick history. It was a 75-year-old male presenting, he's known to have hypertension, COPD, and congestive heart failure. He was brought in by ambulance with worsening shortness of breath, over the last 24 hours. Um, the EMS reported that they were having a bilateral wheeze and Krebs on exam. And so they started him in route uh, on short acting beta agonist, tabutamol, and some prednisolone oral. And then when he arrived to the ED, he was looking quite sick. His vitals were very hypertensive, tachycardic. He was uh, saturating 84. And that was on four liters of oxygen, and his risk rate was 31, and uh, temperature was 36.9. So up front, we tried to improve his stats by increasing the the oxygen by venturi mask, uh, to aiming uh, to 88, you know, between 88 and uh, 92 percent. But the EMS crew, they reported that the patient 
distress and his vital signs did not improve significantly with, all, with the treatment that he had en route. Um, so the question arises is why did this patient with chest wheezing did not respond to that treatment? For everyone to remember, it was a 75 year old gentleman who's COPD and has background of congestive heart failure. So I think as most people would do next uh, is uh, get a chest x-ray. So a uh, chest x-ray was done and if uh, it was looking like this and we get a lot of these x-rays in patients who are COPD ears, which does not tell much uh, regarding the acute dyspnea that they're having. I mean, there is increased vascular markers, uh, uh, markings. He is, it's a hyperinflated chest. Uh, we cannot tell much from it. So what do you do next? You just grab the probe, right? We grab the probe, we scanned his lung fields, and this is what we saw. Uh, just to explain for everyone, uh, I chose this as a simple case just to highlight a few things. You can see, like with the previous quick, uh, case that was presented, these are B lines, multiple B lines originating from the pleura there, and it's going all the way to the bottom of the screen, and that's very important. You can see the depth here is, is, uh, is going up to 15 centimeters. And the, the importance of that is that we do not want to confuse these with Z lines or cometal artifacts, which are very short artifacts that are seen there. But these are B lines, uh, sonographic B lines, which also corresponds to radiologic B lines. Um, and they're going all the way down. And this is scanning the right lung field. And this view was seen in we, back at that time, we were scanning four zones, and this was before the COVID uh, all started. So COVID was not part of the differential. But uh, we were scanning four zones in each hemithorax, rather than the, and we were not scanning the posterior at that point. But the four zones over the right lung field looked pretty much like this, and the left lung field looked even worse with coalescent um, B lines. Uh, if you want to compare them to the right lung field, these were more coalescent B lines. Um, we just grabbed the probe. We had, we had a look at this heart. You can see some reduced contractility onto in his, uh, with uh, a hypokinetic interventricular septum there. And you can see a very plethoric uh, non collapsing IVC on the right of the image there. And we are measuring, obviously, two centimeters from the entry to the right atrium. Uh, but you can see it's just by eyeballing it, it's plethoric, it's non-collapsing, and this patient was actually in fluid overload uh, in acute decompensated pulmonary edema. So we managed him as you would do with a pulmonary edema patient. Instead of NEBS and steroids, we actually gave him uh, high flow oxygen. We maintained sets to his baseline. His baseline was around 92, so we, we aimed at that. We gave him IV nitrates, we gave him a sublingual nitrate until we got the IV drip ready. We gave him furosemide because we thought uh, he was overloaded as well. We did not give morphine, he was not uh, requiring that at that point. And we were getting CPAP um, ready as well. Uh, actually, by the end of, of, of uh, the medication being given, the patient did not require the CPAP actually, and uh, he managed really well just with a IV drip of nitroglycerin and some furosemide, and he markedly improved after that. And the beauty of the ultrasound is that you can repeat it and monitor the, the resolution of the B lines. So on a repeat scan, we, we saw less B lines, which I do not have here. But just to highlight some, um, some evidence behind, thing, behind chest x-ray versus lung ultrasound in these patients. This was a study, I cannot pronounce the name. It was done by Zuru Chaki, I think, and colleagues, uh, comparing ultrasound to x-ray for pulmonary edema. And you can see the accuracy of uh, x-ray was around 58%, and that, of pulmonary, uh, and that of ultrasound for pulmonary edema was 94%, respectively. Uh, now, um, just for everyone to know that to diagnose cardiogenic pulmonary edema, because you can have B lines from COVID, you can have B lines from ARDS, you can have B lines from many things. But to say that these B lines and, that, and the pulmonary edema is cardiogenic, you need to have 
you need to have that in two, uh, in, in both lung fields and in two zones each. So, uh, and that patient had satisfied that criteria. In another study by Lankenstein, um, he compared chest x-ray to ultrasound and he even included physical exam and lung auscultation. And, and you can see the accuracy of lung auscultation versus chest x-ray versus uh, lung ultrasound for interstitial edema uh, was significantly higher for ultrasound. And this just highlights how ultrasound is an extension of our physical exam. I don't think stethoscopes um, are as, as accurate as ultrasounds are, and I think we definitely should be using it much more. Thank you all for this, and these are my accounts. These are the references. Um, any questions? Yeah, so that's a great case, a really great example of um, of how of how you know, how ultrasound is really critically useful. So we've got we've got a question come up here. Did this patient um, a great question? Did this patient have any findings of pulmonary edema on auscultation? So what what yeah. were the best findings when you got you when you got his stethoscope out? Yep. Yeah, so he did have diffuse creps and wheeze. His lung auscultation was not great. He was a patient who's known COPD or with. It's, it's very difficult to auscultate to, to, to point one thing from these patients' auscultation. It's often um, mixed sounds of freezing and, and, and creps that do not point to a single diagnosis. Um, but this patient did have wheeze. However, he did not respond to the, to the nebulizations that he was given. And he did have creps uh, on both lung fields that uh, we thought were more significant for pulmonary edema at that point. Any other questions from anyone for you, for Yasser? It might be interesting to know uh, for people who ask the question, why stethoscope and not ultrasound, or what's the difference in pulmonary edema? You, pulmonary edema, uh, you could, you can see beelines before you can hear crepitations. So even if someone's going into pulmonary edema, you might see them, you might see it before on your ultrasound machine before you can hear them. The other way you could use ultrasound is to decide therapy for these patients. And like Yasser did, to see whether your treatment is working or not. So the B lines are reducing. Or if you don't know whether, it's, whether to differentiate between a patient who's got sepsis and pulmonary edema, or someone who's got both together, uh, you could use uh, the increase in B lines to decide how much fluid you want to give them or, 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 or not. And I always find that useful. Priya, just one question, and, and yes, sir, maybe. In terms of the time frame, uh, so, you know, you see somebody at the front door who, who has this um, presentation, ultrasound confirmed, give treatment. How soon would I start to see an ultrasound improvement in? Um, what are your views? What is your experience on that? You know, when can I go, oh, let me just review this. Is it a couple of hours? Is it the following day? Just because I think there's huge value in how to cater management for these patients uh, and reassessment, etc. Um, uh, okay, yeah, my, so go ahead. Yeah, my experience with that is um, it differs from patient to patient and differs from condition to condition. Um, if a patient is having just mild pulmonary edema and you give him some meds and it, and it works, um, you will find that clinically that the patient's respiratory distress is going is to uh, improve, is, he's going to feel better, his, his tachypnea is going to resolve, his stats are going to improve. But uh, when you have some patient who's having severe pulmonary edema, uh, these medications and these uh, drugs that you're giving might not even resolve his pulmonary edema and he might need non-invasive or invasive ventilation. So the ultrasound resolution of, of, of B lines depends on the patient response and the severity of his presentation. So it's, it's uh, incredibly variable uh, from, from a patient to another and from a, a condition to another. Like for example, for, for a condition like COVID, 
you can see these beelines for weeks. Like we saw one of the emerging physicians who ultrasound his own lungs um, and posted these ultrasound uh, videos in, on Twitter. You could still see the beelines for weeks. But uh, 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 I know that in ICU, uh, the, the resolution of beelines uh, with invasive entity is, is much more, um, is much faster than with, uh, with, with regular patients. Uh, but just, I think what I'm trying to say is it's very variable from one condition to other, another. It's very variable with the severity of the, of the presentation the patient is coming with. Can I ask you a question, Yasser, about, about the practicality of, of, of getting this done in the, in the breathless patient with heart failure? So, so I mean, the case is, is a great example of, of, of the use of POCO to be confident to change tack from treating primary airways disease to treating a primary cardiac disease. But here we've got a patient that's probably much more comfortable sitting up. And you've got this great example of a really nice um, IVC shot. And obviously you're using that as a subcostal. So you're shining. So for those of you who are, who, who are, who are learning echo and haven't done that much, so the subcostal view, it's more helpful with the patient lying down. Actually, you're using the liver as your friend. It's transmitting all that great sound. So you get these beautiful pictures of the heart and of the IVC because they're going through the liver. Um, and you've got to find a way to, to sort of find a way if it's comfortable for them so they're comfortable enough for you to get a good picture and obviously you want to, maybe you want to measure the IVC so you want it to be stable so have you got any kind of hints and tips of how you can get a nice subcostal view when you've got a patient who's got acute heart failure and may want to try and be sitting up as far as possible? Um, well the tricky thing about IVC measurements is um, you, you have to have the patient lying flat. Um, um, you tend to not get very good views uh, if they're upright or they're very tachypnic, but yeah. um, uh, sometimes um, uh, using the liver as an acoustic window greatly helps. So the liver is what transmits your is what's going to transmit the ultrasound waves to get a better image. But if you if you if you um, uh, if you uh, slide your probe a bit more laterally, you can go into more towards the left side, you'll find the colon shadow and that will disturb the image. So a colon that's full of gas, the transverse colon specifically that's full of gas is going to disturb the image and you wouldn't be able to get a good IVC view. Um, so using the liver and uh, scanning in a perpendicular plane, so because that's also a common pitfall that if you're if, 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 if the IVC is like that, is, is a circle and then you're scanning it at the periphery, you're going to get a collapsed IVC. So unless you go really perpendicular and fan to find the, the largest diameter and scan there and measure there, uh, that, that's the most accurate way. And that's how you're going to avoid misinterpreting an IVC assessment. That's really helpful. It's a nice description of, of how, because it's obviously it's a very powerful tool. You've got a really good example of that. But you could have been wrong footed if you sort of, cut off the IVC too early and thought, oh, maybe this guy isn't overloaded. You could, just, got and just to add on uh, whether the patient is laying flat or sitting, mm. the ultrasound can be, for, for, luckily with the lung ultrasound, you can do it with the patient sat up. Yeah. So it wouldn't uh, affect much, but IVC, as you said, is, is a bit different. Okay, have you got any other, any other questions or comments from, from, from Yasser's case? Okay, yes, sir. Thank you so much. That was excellent. A really great case. A lovely example of how you can go and be more confident in completely changing tack. Um, and how, how did the patient do? We've got, we got a clinical follow up? Well, he actually recovered very well. He did not need an NIV, he did not need CPAP, and he was discharged. But uh, we, we tend to, we actually use these modalities a bit more in, in the emergency department because we always get a bit of hesitation from cardiology accepting these patients saying, no, this is COPD or the COPD exacerbation. We get the, the uh, acute medicine saying, this is a, 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 car, a cardiac pulmonary edema. And x-ray does not help a lot. Whereas ultrasound uh, is, is a great tool in these patients. Definitely, definitely, definitely. That's a great case. Okay, thank you. So should we move on to Helen? Helen, are you with us? Thank you so much for, oh, 
can you hear me? Perfectly. Yes, okay, great, perfect. So let me just share my screen. It won't be long. So thank you so much, everybody, for being uh, with us tonight. Um, it's so great to meet you again. For those of you uh, who, does, who do, do, do not know me, basically, you probably will recognize my voice. If not, I highly encourage you to have a look at, have a watch at my video, at our video that we produced and um, hopefully it's going to help, um, it's going to help you. So I have some clinical cases today as well as last week. So these are really fresh cases that I've seen over the last few nights. Um, oops, sorry, does it work? Yeah, okay, perfect. Can you see it? Perfect. Perfect, great. So over the last few nights, uh, so uh, perfect. So let's go with the, the, the first um, case. So a 43-year-old um, female who arrives uh, com um, complaining of fever and shortness of breath. She is not known to have any past medical history. She is fit and well. She never smoked in her life. She's only on progesterone pill for andrometriosis. That's it. She's a healthcare worker and then she swabbed positive two days ago, okay? She is day seven, uh, day seven of onset. So it started like, our symptoms started like quite co in, the, in the COVID, um, in a COVID setup. So basically initially dry cough with some fever and acute shortness of breath as, at rest and chest heaviness. And then she said that um, she had an acute shortness of breath, of breath sorry, a sorry, couple of, of hours ago, basically. Um, she was really unwell. She was really worried about her breathing. She lives alone. So she came and she had a long flight a month ago. So when we saw her, um, she had a respiratory rate of 20. Uh, she was afebrile. Heart rate was 81, saturating pretty well, <laughs> perfectly on room hair with a good blood pressure. Auscultation was pretty normal and she did not even desaturate on exertion. So we did right away the long ultrasound. So this is what we found. So this is R1 that we can see. So she is not known for any cardiac uh, failure or any problem. So right away, first uh, long zone on the right um, on the right side of her chest, she had coalescent and multiple, basically like a waterfall. Uh, appearance of multiple B lines as described by my colleague earlier. So basically they start from, um, they start really from the top, from the pleura, going down the screen, uh, keeping the same um, brightness all the way down. And then, um, and that's what you see here in the middle, you can see the shadow uh, secondary to a, a costal rib. And on this, oops, whoop, 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 whoop. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. And then um, basically, so features are patchy because within only um, two spaces. So basically on this view, you can see two spaces at the same time. On the left side, it's white with a waterfall beeline appearance all the way. And then on the, on the, sorry, on the left, sorry. And on the right, you have the normal um, pleura appearance and um, a bit thickened though with a bit of um, subpleural consolidations, a bit, 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 quite discreet, but with some A-lines. So it shows us really the patchy, um, the patchy features of COVID. And then let's have a look at, at another video. So, sorry. That is great. I'm just gonna. So here is another region as well. So basically, um, you can still see um, some pleural thickening and some subpleural consolidations here. Um, you can see some discrete, more discrete B lines, um, and you can definitely have a look at the liver, who flashes um, basically just below the, uh, the the curtain occasioned by the lung. So um, it's all consistent with, um, with probably COVID. Okay, so then we reported all the lung ultrasound. So I won't go from, uh, I won't go zone, to, zone by zones. Uh, we'll just go, this is basically the, um, the way to report it on the, on the EPR. So basically, basically she had 
pleural thickening all the way, okay, from, so basically all the way. Uh, she kept her A lines uh, in a few zones, but she mainly had some, uh, basically the right lung was more affected than the left one. Okay, and then on echo, so here you can see some echo. So it's her heart, so then you can definitely see if we start from the top again, so I cannot see my curse. Oh, so sorry. Something is struggling, struggling with the internet connection tonight. So, so here on the left, basically you can see her heart. This is the parasternal long axis view. So from the top till below, the first structure you will see is the right ventricle. And then, so I'm just going to go slowly, just make sure. So this is the right ventricle, and then you have all the left ventricle down there. Yep. This is a bit, uh, I'm just going to come back. When she breathes in and out, of course, you will have some um, different view of your heart. So sometimes you have to be really um, patient to be able to see everything. Okay. So here you see the left ventricle, and then basically here, you have the left atrium. You can definitely see that the, vi the mitral valve is touching the septum with every contraction, so that's pretty good. So she has a good, con a good contractility, a good function. It's quite symmetric. And then you can see that she didn't have any pericardiac effusion. So this is on the right side. You have the parastinal short axis view. Um, which collaborates um, basically with the findings we already found. X-ray has been done. patient has been discharged home with some DTO of doxycycline as per the trust guidelines and with some, um, some delta parin as well with the new guidelines uh, that you all probably received uh, in your inbox this week. Um, she's been advised to self-monitor her saturation and with some safety netting. But then a few hours after, back on my night and then boom, she's back. Few hours after, she feels really unwell. She says that the shortness of breath is worse. She feels that she breathes more sh in a more in a more shallow, um, uh, with an ongoing chest heaviness. Well, she's really unwell. Okay, Obs obs observations are all perfect. Basically, apyrexic res respiratory rate is 18, 90, 96 on room air. Does not desaturate on exertion neither. Point a CT NGO, which collaborated as well our findings on long ultrasound. So it's just to show you basically that that long ultrasound was really efficient to accurately diagnose um, a patient with COVID, um, even with uh, basically a normal um, chest X-ray to our eyes. To be honest, like to the first for the first like on, in an acute setting, um, quite normal X-ray for the patient. Perfect. And then just another case, so that will finally um, conclude all the cases we had tonight. So just, just a, a fluid management case here. So Henry Sass, you're in Resp ED, a 92 years old, has been pre-alerted by the crew, an acute shortness of breath. He is known COPD with heart failure, and then he's having a really crappy blood pressure, 92 over um, on 76, 77, sorry. Heart rate is tachycardic, he's saturating really on well, like 88 with 10 liters of oxygen. Uh, he's breathing fast and he is uh, subfebrile, well, febrile. So just wanna show you what showed us the long ultrasound. Without any surprise, you will have B lines all around, okay? So some B lines all around. It could have been worse, I agree. It could have been worse, but you can see. 
So, but then surprise here on the right side and on the left side, you have some massive pleural effusions. Okay. So basically to obtain these images, the patient was, um, he was basically at 45 degrees, uh, how he was able to breathe. And then you um, basically, you take your probe, the abdominal probe as usual. I stay, I, I used the, um, the, the, the long setting. So I remained it with the long setting basically. So the probe is oriented vertical, marker towards the head, and you are directly to uh, right, right next to the diaphragm basically. So here you can see the liver, okay with the bright diaphragm that you can see all the way and here basically down there okay this is the spine that you can see and a really important feature that i didn't mention in the video but basically when you have a pleural effusion like that which is quite a severe one okay you will have the spinal sign so you will be able to see the spinal line all the way okay like higher up in the chest, where normally you won't be able to see it. So if you are able to see the spinal line, okay, it means that you have some fluid that, that, that allows you to see deeper in the chest. So basically there is a pleural effusion. And then here you can see that it's quite a severe one and then it doesn't really appear and unfortunately i couldn't find a clip where you could definitely see but you can you can see that there is a the tip of the of the lung that is like kind of floating in a kind of fish tail sign it's kind of floating in the pleural effusion so basically you can uh, it's it's worthwhile um it, it, it worth it um to have a look at the pleural effusions so as explained earlier basically Pleural effusions are quite rare in COVID. So with this patient, okay, had a look as well as his heart. So his heart, as you probably all would expect, okay, was really poorly contractile, okay. You have a really poor ejection fraction here, probably like 20-ish, 25%, okay. Um, so basically you cannot see a really good contraction it's almost um, still so and then here's the four chamber view so just to give you a bit more a bit more uh, images to see basically this is the four five four and five chamber views um, so you can definitely see that you can compare basically both sides of the ventricles so ventricle right ventricle here on the left and then bigger here, the left ventricle. So this is normal um, and probably a bit rotated, to be honest, it was quite difficult to obtain uh, this view. So um, a, a bit probably rotated a bit off of the axis, but then you can definitely know that, uh, you can definitely see that the right ventricle is smaller than the left ventricle. There was no per per pericardial effusion and uh, you can see the poorly contractile um, way that his um, heart is beating. So basically, he had um, a sepsis, a COVID, and an acute cardiac failure. So this is where basically, and then I didn't, um, I'm sorry, I didn't um, catch the, uh, I didn't, um, sorry, save the clip for the IVC, but he was uh, over, over uh, loaded. So it was a, a clear case here on how long ultrasound can help you and helped me basically to manage is fluid um, so I gave him a little bit uh, at the time um, in a safely manner um, just to make sure that we will correct and help for his sepsis and at the same time do not overflow his uh, lungs. Do you have any question? Those were two fantastic cases Helen. Um, Really, really, really good, really good. Um, before we go to questions, can I just get um, uh, Vishaka to sort of tell us a little bit about the panel? Because you showed us a really helpful capture of the EPR panel. Yeah. I think it's been a bit updated. Vishaka, do you want to just quickly tell the group about adaptations to it? Because I'm somebody that probably should start using that, um, but I don't, but I need to. So um, Vishaka needs to educate me and hopefully someone else, uh, others on the call too. Yeah. 
thanks, Dan. Can you all hear me? Yeah, yeah. great. Okay, great. Um, so I spoke about the power note last time, where I did uh, just do a brief, um, you know, PowerPoint presentation showing how to access it. Now, since then, I've had a few people suggest to make a few changes, and some of those suggestions were really good. So I've added just three changes. So when you open the power note now, actually four, sorry. Uh, when you open the power note, you'll see a picture on top, which you should not be trying to write anything in the picture. It's just a guide to show you the zones. So you'll see R1, R2, R3, R4, and you know, the lung opening out and the left side also. The second thing is I've added a small tag which says supervisor's name. This is for all those of us who are being trained to do a scan. We can still scan and then put in a supervisor's name in there. Um, especially if you've not finished, uh, you know, the specified training that Priya is trying to get all of us to do. The third change is um, when I made the power note the first time, the left lung was above and the right lung below. But some of the experts who scan frequently said we usually start on the right side. So I've moved the right lung table up. So just in case you've used it before, you might just get confused. So it's swapped over now. It comes right lung first and then left. And the last change I've done is I've added a small box at the end for summary of focus. So this is just because a lot of people said, in, despite putting in the X's, we, some of us want to summarize our findings. And you may want to add things like, um, you know, when you didn't get a clear view or anything else that is informative for us later. Uh, it would be good to summarize your findings in, you know, however you'd like to do it. So there is a box which will accept text, just free text for summary. So just these four changes um, for anybody who's using the Power Note and please do use it. It's good to have it all documented. That's yeah. it from my end. Thank you. Thanks, Vish. Like a message, uh, message received loud and clear. I'll start using it. Thank you. Um, Thank you. <laughs> um, can I can I just sort of throw this throw a question open? Um, and Cam's right on there actually. And my question was about how you talk to. Let's say you want to make a medical referral, and you've done some amazing POCUS work, and you've got a you've you've, you've done some really sort of nuanced diagnostic stuff with POCUS. How do you? And you want to talk to a med reg or or, or whoever's taking calls. Um, to hand a patient over that needs to come in. Um, how, how do you communicate your findings to somebody who may not have trained with POCUS uh, and might be going, well, ECG x-ray, what are you telling me? So, so how do you, how, how have you, what's been your experience about communicating these findings? Who's the question to? <laughs> sorry, to any, 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 sorry, sorry, Anyone? it was a free for all. A free for all for the ED POCUS users when they're when they're handing patients over to, to medicine and making referrals and they they want to use their POCUS findings as the kind of jewel in the crown of their assessment. Um, how, how do you how, is it, how do you talk to medicine about that if if in medicine we haven't got such a, a, a an advanced culture yeah. point of care ultrasound? Um, I think I think I, I can go just for a, a quick thing and it, I, I think so far it's wonderful. Our people is interesting interested in it um i had like really good um comments they're like they're really interested so i'm really um it's really it's really it's really nice to have this opportunity to um to explore and then to, to tell what you found on the on the uh, ultrasound so that's really great so first that's great to have an open mind on a new uh, technology and second um basically it depends you will see when i discuss if the patient, if the um, the med reg or the person I'm trying to refer the patient to, um, if uh, I can see, like I can feel that there is some like question marks, they don't understand at all what I'm saying or something. I just say, um, well, um, I found some COVID features on his lung as well or on a, on their lung uh, of the patient, and then um, and then especially uh, some subpleural consolidation. So basically, I'm trying to focus on what will change the management according to who am I referring to, of course. So if I want, um, let's say, a medic uh, review, and then with the complexity of the case, or then it depends, I will either focus on the B lines or on the subpleural consolidations, or then, so it would mean, so it, it, it means that there's probably a pneumonia coming, and then, so I'm trying to, 
just to keep it like in simple terms to make sure that everyone understands and everybody keeps their interest as well. So this is my experience so far pretty well. Okay. I was just going to add something there. I think um, Kareem's flagged this on the chat. Um, in, as important as it is in terms of verbal communication and handover, the kind of summary at the end of the POCUS report also needs to be something that people can easily understand and, and use in their clinical practice. I mean, I, um, on the other side, so Priya kindly joined me for a couple of takes and we ended up, you know, using POCUS for quite a few cases. I think, how many maybe? Six, seven cases? Priya yeah. scanned kindly over a couple of days. And I think... Um, and I found myself when I was talking to, because one of the patients went to respiratory um, high dependency, and when I was talking to them, and I, oh, we, we've done a, a point of care ultrasound on, I suspect um, what will happen, the more scans people see, the more scans uh, people come across, the more reporting that's done. And if we start using it in the lingo, then people at the receiving end of the referral, so the medical registrars, all anybody else referring, um, receiving the referral will start to become more familiar with the language used and more familiar with, oh, actually, this could, you know, give us a better idea of what's going on. So I think it's really helpful that we are starting to see it more. And I definitely want to get a bit more experience on doing the lingo. Can I just add, um, I think it's, we're in a time where we're getting really uh, great feedback from other specialties and everyone is open to ultrasound, but it's, my experience, although mostly positive, I've had lots of experiences where uh, uh, people who aren't familiar with it have been very skeptical about it. Uh, some of them, some of the experience have been actually quite hostile, where I've been told by radiologists, uh, you shouldn't be doing this, you're messing around with things that you're not, you're not supposed to be, or, uh, and, and some people just, just not, not believing what we're doing. And that's, and that's okay, people can, can just feel a bit threatened by something that there that they haven't been doing um and i think just acknowledge that if you do if you do receive hostility uh, that it's it's not uncommon but it's becoming less and less i think what's really important is that for those who aren't uh, used to pocus is for us not to lead in with pocus as the as, as the as the main impetus of our of our clinical uh, decision making rather that we should use it as part of the rest of the examination history and traditional imaging and bloods etc um, and certainly it's a lot better to, to say to someone in a referral, the lungs look wet on ultrasound rather than I can see bee lines everywhere because then, uh, you know, for them it means, it means nothing. So, yeah, I think uh, people are definitely becoming a lot more accepting, but uh, just, just be mindful that not everyone is, is entirely on board yet. And we're, we're slowly trying to convince everyone. That's a really good point, Karim. Thank you. It's, uh, yeah, like Karim said, uh, the, the use of easily, you know, easy language, wet instead of B lines or clear instead of A lines, or I can see something and not just hear it. So, uh, like you said, Kareem, uh, uh, there is unequal air entry and on auscultation, I heard some creps and on, B, you know, focus, I did this. So you, you blend it in into your presentation, not keep it as at the end to say, and also I did focus, which showed one, two, three, four things. Then, then it becomes outside of your clinical thing. And what I found is people then tend to say, no, don't tell me about focus. Tell me what you did in your clinical exam. So I tend to add in or blend it in into my presentation. Uh, the other thing I think it's very important for everyone to understand is uh, in I, I've been here for about six, seven, seven years now. Uh, it's important for all of us uh, when we're teachers as well to explain to the learner and to other people that there are limitations of focus and we all need to know those limitations. If we insist that no, I have done this and this is absolutely the right thing then it's a little bit difficult for people to accept it. So yes, you know, it is likely to be, when I see this, it is likely to be a certain diagnosis. I, I find that helpful and then people are not as defensive. Uh, and I think Dan will want to say something to people who tell us that we shouldn't be using focus. Dan, what do you have to say? 
Well, I, I think when someone's saying that, they're saying it, uh, uh, you're right, Karim, I think this comes from a position of threat. Um, and, and, uh, uh, and it's, and it's the dynamic situation, because often the people who, the people who, who sat, comes at it is usually having a manic busy day and is just angry and a bit cross. Uh, and so you've got somebody who's already far too busy. Again, well, actually, with the, more the, the, more, the more poker skills we acquire, then the less formal imaging we will need because we've made our decision. Tests should, should change our decisions. If we've made our decisions and we're comfortable in that, so that's fine. I think one thing that you, Pri, you and I talked about is that, is that by helping this group to kind of come together, we're already twice the size of last week. Um, we're, we're kind of forming a deep state within the hospital. So there's those of us that use POCUS and make decisions. And then when a patient has to escape and go to traditional care, then they have to adjust it everything else. I mean, the reality is it's more blended, as you say. But I can't point when actually, once we've made a good confident decision because of our skills, then actually, then we've got a much more targeted use of additional imaging of, radio, of, of, of full radiology. Um, and that will ultimately improve their workflow. Um, and and just sometimes I think we just, we know we're right, we just bide our time. Um, people can be as hostile as they like, and that hostility usually comes from threat. And I think when people are feeling threatened, I think the best thing I like is just to back off because you're never going to win. Um, we go, well, okay, I'll take a viewpoint. I think it's important to, you know, to have, have breaks on innovation or provide some check and balance or you bring balance to our innovation. I think that's important so we don't go too fast, too quickly, that kind of language. And then they feel validated and everyone can walk away feeling they've won and it's all right. I think you, ha you have to notice that because that could turn easily into a flashpoint and suddenly they start throwing all manner of stuff at us and we just don't want that. So, 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 so I think that's how I kind of handle that. I'm, I'm conscious of time, but I'm pretty, I wanted, could you say a couple of things about certification and our in-house way to kind of bring everybody, um, bring everybody with us in, in, in a way, that just for a couple of minutes, that'd be okay. And then that'd be a nice point to end this webinar. I think you're muted. Sorry. I thought, I thought, I'm, yeah. I'm getting really old. Hang on, okay, okay, fine. Uh, so the Royal College of Emergency Medicine has its own way of uh, sort of certifying people. There are four levels that you have to go through. Um, if, uh, the first one is where you learn about a particular scan. The next one where, is where you gain experience about that scan. The third stage is you ask for an assessment. So you go and take an exam. And the last one is yet you get signed off to, to then do it independently. So I think we're going to follow the same sequence of doing things. Uh, in the learning phase, uh, we're going to have, uh, we have you, you must for lung ultrasound as such. And this is something that was discussed in, in the larger sort of webinar that the emergency physicians had all over UK. Um, I think it was about seven, 10 days ago. And um, it, it's, not, it's not formal, formal into the college guidelines, but there's consensus that long ultrasound is pretty easy to pick up. It's very easy to learn uh, and it's very easy to um, interpret. So uh, learn something, learn the scan. So watch the video, uh, look at the Dropbox, uh, then you're going to need to make sure you've done your RCHEM modules on nobology governance and you sort of basically understand what to do with ultrasound. Uh, we're going to ask for continuous learning, like for every other skill. So uh, we, we're going to ask people to come to these webinars because we're going to have continuous learning via these webinars. So there must be attendance at webinars. Um, and then if you would like it, you must ask a tutor, one of the POCUS gurus uh, on this group, to maybe teach you a little bit face-to-face -face while you're on shift with them. Uh, so a, a little bit of a practical teaching. It can't be as uh, extended uh, like a, a day-long workshop that we do for other scans. But because we say lung ultrasound is quite easy to learn, a, a five-minute sort of demo from a tutor to you. So see you know watch one from a dem uh, from someone who else is doing is, is enough uh, so that's the learning phase for the experience phase uh, when you go for level two in the archem um, sort of uh, level two lung ultrasound they, they ask for they ask you to do 20 scans 10 of which need to be supervised so we've said that at least 10 scans that you do for lung 
in, in, in while learning this should be supervised. Uh, and the more you do them, the better you will get and the better the person who is sort of supervising you will know that you know, you know what you're doing, you know what you're talking about, you know how to do the scan and how to interpret it. But uh, we're going to do, all of them should be supervised. You'll have to fill in the power note for each one of them. Uh, and you'll have to do the scan in, in the way we like you to do it, uh, which is there in the video. So put the patient details in, scan every, uh, all of the 12 zones, if you can, if you can, if the patient's not that sick. And then you have to come for a, uh, a school, a competency assessment. And one of the uh, sort of defined tutors will take your exam, uh, which will be either uh, in a, in a, in, on a model or, or uh, on a patient after you've done those 10 scans. And when everything is complete, we can think about then saying, yes, you're okay to do your own scan. This is, this is sort of the proposed certification that we're thinking of. Um, I think Karim might be able to tell us a little bit more about what the acute medicine guys have been doing uh, in, in, in their scanning. Um, okay, so um, as with most POCUS things, acute medicine, uh, it lags a bit behind emergency medicine, but uh, we've got our own uh, training accreditation. It's called uh, FAMOUS. I'm just gonna share uh that screen really quickly just to show you all very quickly where the website is uh so it's called focused acute medicine ultrasound it's run by the society of acute medicine um you can find it on in the acute medicine website quite easy if you just write if you just write famous sam in google um and it, it has uh, three modules it has uh, ultrasound of the, the lungs uh, the abdomen and DVT. So similar to uh, the, the intensive care one, but geared more towards acute medicine. Uh, so you can find all the information here. Essentially, you have to find a supervisor. Um, you, there's a course that you'll need to attend. They're not running now, but you can still acquire uh, images for your logbook. And you, it tells you how many scans you need to, uh, you need to accredit, you need to, you need to have done for accreditation. Um, and there's another website here called famous.org.uk, which has got modules, pathology, uh, which is all really good for, for, for learning. Um, but essentially, um, it's not uh, running in the same way. They acknowledge that because of the pandemic, you can't, hold, you can't hold courses, you can't be teaching the same way you could because of the infection risk. But if you are acquiring images, uh, then you can have them supervised by, by one of the famous supervisors, and I'm one of them. I mean, I'm happy to sign this for people's logbooks and then you can keep them in for when things resume normality. You can count towards your accreditation. Great. Thank you, Cam. That's really helpful. Okay. Um, and yeah, and then someone's also put on the chat that the Electronic Learning for Health has got um, what's called the Ice Blue training, uh, which is... Um, which I've done as well, apart from the FICE intensive care echo and lung ultrasound. So there's, there's several. But, um, Priya, from your perspective, is the ice blue equivalent to the ARCHEM modules in terms of overall introduction, would you say? So the ice blue, uh, the one that I've seen, uh, is, is a combination of both the lung ultrasound and a little bit of echo. It's not just to do with lung ultrasound. The echo bit that emergency physicians need is echo in life support. Uh, level two echo is completely different. So you need a little bit more knowledge about echo. Right. Um, it's not just echo and life support, you know, not just finding out why someone's in cardiac arrest. Uh, there's, more, there's a little bit more in the ice blue um, learning package, but it's great. It's, it's very good if you want an initial, um, uh, it, it is quite detailed actually, it's quite good. It's quite good. Um, but it's a combination of two scans a level one and a level two for emergency physicians. So, um, yeah. Yeah, and from Karen there, famous package on, on, on there as well, a bit more thorough uh, from the line of sound. Okay, so, so lots of great um, uh, res free resources um, for training um, on this. And I think I'm conscious of time and that everyone's you know, either tired or about to go and do some work. So I think we'll try and call things to a close. We've had some fantastic cases really great to see so really great examples of of, of how more sensitive um 
polycarbonate of this compared with chest x-ray. We've got these persistent changes for a long time after symptoms in COVID. So really learning, ultrasound is really helping us learn more about this brand new disease that's parachuted into our clinical lives in the last few months. Um, great example of how it can completely make you back a different horse clinically and go from airways disease to primary uh, lung disease and a really important uh, common condition. So that'll be great not to be um, um, wrong footed by, by that using ultrasound um, when you've got sort of cardiac asthma features. Um, and then some nice cases of new showing deterioration uh, in POCUS uh, and some really great images uh, to help us kind of learn all the different patterns which we can see COVID. So a really fantastic set of cases. Thanks to everybody for your questions and for discussion and for coming. Um, and we hope this will become a regular must attend event in your weekly calendar. Priya. Um, we want to switch over to Microsoft Teams yeah, for next yeah. time. So uh, before, I think we'll, we'll give you a little bit of a, uh, we won't have something next week probably, but in 10 days time, uh, we might have the next webinar. So I'll, I'll advertise it when it's going to happen, uh, probably in the next couple of days. But please, please make sure your Microsoft Teams account yeah. set up and ready so that you can attend the next, next uh, webinar. Great, we can have more files there. Okay, everyone, so stay safe, keep well, um, and look forward to seeing you all next time.